Good evening, everyone. I want to call this meeting to order. We, uh, uh, first of all, let's take a roll, if you please. Council Member Angler. Here. Council Member Newman. Here. Council Member Taylor. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Adam. And I'm here. We do have a closed we, session. And if and our, we do have the mayor absent tonight. Yes. Uh, yes. Momentarily. Anyway, we have a closed session tonight. Our city attorney will announce it. That's correct. Thank you. We have one closed session, a conference with legal counsel pursuant to government code section 94956.92. Notice of threatened litigation under the uh, California Voting Rights Act, anticipated litigation. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll adjourn now and be back at 6. Thank you all.
Let's call the meeting to order. I'm gonna turn the meeting over here to uh, our city attorney, Tracy Noonan, to report on the closed session that we had before this meeting started. Thank you, Mayor Magnamy, and I have nothing to report. That was short, very good. Can we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Any requests for continuances? Uh, that would be not continuance. Uh, that becomes under a separate section. City Clerk, please open up the public comments. Thank you. This is the time and place for public comments. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. One individual has requested to speak and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. The yellow light displays when you have one minute remaining. For those who are with the public comments, at 15 seconds left of your three minute time, I will quietly say 15 seconds. So that way you know to wrap up your thoughts and comments. If you are here in house, please come down. I will have you speak at the podium and the next person up I will call, have a seat behind. So that way the transition is rather quick. So first up on Zoom, we have Mina Van Kant Tremen. Uh, Mina, you're on, you have three minutes. Please begin. Hi, thank you, Mayor, and thank everyone here. My name is Mina. I am um, a mental health coach for one of the largest nonprofits in the world called the Art of Living Foundation. And uh, we are collaborating with the government in, in DC with Mayor of DC to bring a huge festival at the DC grounds where more than 100,000 people are registered. And the reason I'm, why I'm bringing this to the notice of Taz and Oaks is because the founder of Art of Living, who's a global peace humanitarian, is coming to Taz and Oaks. And I request a meeting with the mayor's office to share more about how we can collaborate on the platform of mental health, uh, given that this is going to be the biggest DEI mental health platform ever in the history of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. And there, I don't see any other speakers for public comments. So I'm gonna turn this over to city manager. Any comments? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll have uh, members of CMO staff follow up with the speaker. Thank you. We'll move on to consent calendar and uh, any items that wish to be pulled by uh, council members. Mr. Newman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to uh, pull item P for later discussion. E as in? P as in Peter. As in what? P as in Papa. P as in Papa, thank you. Excellent, so we're gonna pull item P as in Papa and uh, could I have a motion to move the, oh, we do have speakers, we do actually. Um, can I ask city clerk to do me the favor and remove the screen that we have? Never mind, I figured out how to do it, excellent. First up on Zoom, we have Pedro Toscano. Pedro, you have three minutes, go ahead and begin. Pedro, I'm sorry, Pedro. I registered for item number nine. That's what we're doing right now. Item nine is the consent calendar, so this is public comment. You'll have three minutes, so begin when you're ready. Okay, give me a second, thank you. Wow. Thank you. Are you ready to begin? I apologize, I wasn't ready. Uh, my name is Pedro Toscano. I'm a member of Southwest Mountain States Regional Council of Carpenters. I live in the local area and, and, and work in the, and recreate in the vicinity of this project. I believe I will be impacted by the environmental impacts of this project. The city should require project to be built with contractors that will hire locally, pay prevailing wage and util utilize apprentices from a state certified apprenticeship training program. Workforce requirements reduce construction related environmental impacts while benefiting the local economy and workforce development. In a recent study, 2020 report entitled Putting California in the High Road, a Jobs and Climate Action Plan for 2030, the California Workforce Development Board concluded that investments in growing, diversifying it, and upskilling California's workforce can positively affect returns on climate mitigation efforts. The South Coast, 
The South Coast Air Quality Management District recently found that local hire requirements can result in air pollutant reductions. Recently, the state of California reiterated its commitment towards encouraging workforce developments and housing affordability. Through the Affordable Housing and High Roads Job Act of 2022, otherwise known as Assembly Bill 2011, which, which requires projects to pay workers a prevailing wage and hire from state accredited apprenticeship programs for projects meeting certain uh, siting affordability and development uh, standards. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and I'm sorry I uh, lagged it in the beginning. Next up, we have in-house Rosanna Guerra. And after Rosanna, we have uh, Bonnie Shubb. Bonnie, come on down and have a seat behind and you'll be called up next. Careful coming down. Take your time. Is uh, Bonnie Shubb in the house here? Bonnie, please uh, go ahead and have a seat behind and we'll call you up here shortly. Rosanna, go ahead and proceed. Members, my name is Rosanna Guerra and I'm a 30 year resident of the city of Thousand Oaks. My purpose today is to highlight my concerns regarding the city's transition to district based elections and the creation of district maps. I wanted to begin by pointing out two areas that caused me the greatest concern as the city moved through this process and they are as follows. Number one is transparency and number two, the role of the Thousand Oaks Boulevard development. So my first point is transparency. My expectation was that during this process, it would follow the same example of transparency as I experienced with the Conejo Recreation and Park District. I attended three out of the four meetings and asked the demographer if a point on the map of each city council member would be shown for each map submitted. This for me was an important point by providing the approximate residential area of each city council member on the map it would alleviate any doubt of incumbency protection. This was not adhered to. Maps were submitted to NDC and uploaded to the website without the knowledge of who authored the maps. This is a particular concern since only the author of map 104 and 113 was made available to the community. Maps 106 and 111 were never challenged as was the case of 104 and 113. It was only after the initial vote by city council to only accept 106 and 111 and reluctantly add 104 that I was made aware that 111 was submitted by a special interest group with ties to the Thousand Oaks Boulevard Association. Now, every constituent can author a map. My concern as a taxpayer is that I have the right to know who authored those maps and face the same scrutiny as map 104 and 113. All other maps were thrown out that were submitted by the demographer, giving me the appearance, right or wrong, that this, was the whole, that the, this whole process was an exercise in futility and that a map had already been agreed upon long before the process began. My second point is the role of the development of the Thousand Oaks Boulevard. This point came up time and again, voiced by one of the city council members as the reason to add Westlake Hills neighborhood to area five, rather than remain intact with Westlake Village. The reason was that Westlake Hills should have a voice in whatever development happens along the boulevard, which is confusing because any development along the boulevard goes to the planning commission and city council for approval. And how would Westlake Hills have a voice in any development? Do they call the city council member that represents Area 5? And how is that any different from any of us calling about issues that have to do with the boulevard? Thank you. Next up, we have Bonnie Shubb, SHUBB. Bonnie, you have uh, three minutes. And after Bonnie, we have Sally Hibbets. Sally, come on down and have a seat behind. Go ahead. I'm Bonnie Shubb. Good evening. <clears throat> Last week, I tried to explain to this council that many community members were fearful that you would be trying to keep your old boys club intact rather than even listening to the community you are supposed to serve. And you did just that. A convoluted method of voting was contrived by Mayor McNamee, which it appeared no one understood. The mayor made three or four times suggestions to his pals that they can, meant as should, 
vote none or no or zero. The passage of that vote meant that the preferred map 113, as endorsed by every one of the emails submitted to the council prior to that meeting, at least 155 of them, plus all the in-person and Zoom speakers would not even be mentioned by name, nor presented individually for a vote. The mayor even stifled any support given to the speakers by the rest of the community in attendance by eliminating applause. He knew, however, that everyone there was in support of Map 113. That silencing of support even included the well-written and presented opinions of a few high school students who were here to see democracy in action and left in shock and disillusionment along with the rest of us. So what now? Why am I speaking tonight? To let you know that since you didn't take appropriate action, we need to do so. You will see that by saving one of your council members, which might have been lost via Map 113, you have unleashed a community-wide campaign for the future of council elections. We are searching for candidates in each district who will care about their constituents no matter where in Thousand Oaks they live. We will put together a committee to vet those future council candidates, and with resources from all over the district, from Dos Vientos, where I live, all the way to C area by CLU, to Westlake, and all the other areas, including the, uh, the um, apartments along um, the boulevard uh, and the other areas of, of Thousand Oaks. We will be providing information to the voters as each of their districts come up for election. We are empowered by your behavior last week. And this enthusiasm will last unto us until all districts are represented by people who care about all the special interests in our 15 city. 15 seconds. Next up, we have Sally Hibbets, and after that, we have Diane Birchman. Sally, you have three minutes. Go ahead and begin when you're ready. Good evening. Missed opportunities. We are often faced with missed opportunities, but in our private lives, it's usually just between us and our conscience. However, last Tuesday, with the mapping issue, our city council had several missed opportunities which could have been changed for the better. One, it was a missed opportunity by our council for, one, for once to recognize that the city is not necessarily made up of primarily white, out-of-town business people who only care about having their own political influence being heard by city hall. It was a missed opportunity by the council majority to gratefully thank over 100 letter writers plus over 30 people present who took time out of their busy lives to attend a council meeting. Instead, there were one or two mumbled quick thank yous and not much else. It was a missed opportunity by the council to thank some high school teens for speaking out, which is extremely difficult for many of them. Do you have any idea how hard it is for some kids to even get up in front of their classroom, let alone come down here with all these adults in a strange place? It was a missed opportunity by the council to have an essential conversation with many community groups who provide highly necessary support to underserved communities. It was a missed opportunity for the council majority to realize that the selection of a map which protects their incumbencies is highly distasteful to a large group of voters in this city. It was a missed opportunity by the council majority to understand this is not a partisan issue, but rather an issue of trying to represent the underserved who need to have a seat at the table of influence. It was a missed opportunity by the council majority to recognize the dedicated public participation by at least 17 citizens who spent a great deal of time to provide the draft, draft maps that were used by the paid demographer. It was a missed opportunity that you could have used to recognize those 17 people and have them come to a council maybe, meeting, maybe last week, to receive a certificate of appreciation uh, for thanking them for their service. Instead, their names were kept quiet and their further public input was ignored. It was a missed opportunity for the council to have the map makers of those three focus maps step forward and provide input at a public hearing, plus perhaps answering your questions. Perhaps one of you 
might have asked the creators of maps 106B and 111B why their maps justified incumbent protection. 15 seconds. So I invite you not to miss any more opportunities to reach out to underserved residents. You definitely missed a great opportunity by adopting such a weak map. Thank you for the opportunity. Diane Birchman, and after Diane, Chase Rashid. Chase, come on over and have a seat behind. You have three minutes. Begin when you're ready. Good evening. I'm Diane Birchman, resident of Thousand Oaks. I'm speaking on behalf of AUW, past president and current board member. I'm here to address the approval last Tuesday of Map 106B in lieu of the consideration of Map 113. What I witnessed last week was not an example of good governance. It was performative at best. The four California factors are to be considered in order of priority. Community interest is ranked number two. Recognizing the underserved and underrepresented communities was not given more weight than three or four. And not logically including Westlake Hills and the Westlake portion also does not adhere to giving proper weight to the number two factor. The threshold to the extent practical is not that high. Is it feasible, capable of being done or carried out with reasonable effort? And as you know, Map 113 was referred to by Kristen Parks as extremely balanced in population, near 0% total deviation. The Martinez cage, which is not dissimilar in its fact pattern than what we are contending with, was referred to at a prior meeting, was not clearly presented. The reason the plaintiffs did not prevail was because coincidentally and ironically, the passage at the same time of AB 849, the Fair Maps Act, ended up tying the hand of the judge because the FMA was not in effect when the city approved its map, and therefore it was technically legal. Although Judge Treat called the map absurd and said, quote, bluntly the map verges on self-parody and flouts the state election code. The Martinez map in drafting AB 849 was even used as an illustration of why the FMA was necessary. And according to its author, the then assembly member Rob Bonta, now our attorney general, its goal was to encourage broad participation in the redistricting process, particularly underrepresented and marginalized communities. He is still working vigorously to enforce that goal. Think Los Angeles. In spring of this year, San Luis Obispo adopted a new redistricting map after repealing the original map. There was a court settlement wherein they agreed to repeal and replace. Redistricting decisions made are not without their legal ramification. It is no surprise that there are now over 20 cities and counties using the independent redistricting commissions, collectively accounting for 42% of our state's population. In the end, this is about the little d, democracy, listening to the people and representing them. Voters choose their representatives, not representatives choosing their voters. The Latino youth leaders who spoke out last week were courageous, articulate, and hopeful that their voices would make a difference. They left feeling disempowered and not heard. Next up, we have Chase Rashid, and after that, Patricia. Chase Rashi, 24-year resident of the city of Thousand Oaks. Now, I would like to address an area of concern from the last meeting. There was a comment that Map 113 was not contiguous, and this was not an accurate statement. And I've submitted a close-up image of the precinct in question to show that it, it was, in fact, contiguous. Um, TOTV, I'd like to, yeah. So. Furthermore, the demographer stated at the 620 meeting that the connection between Las Casitas and the rest of District 5 was in fact contiguous in the earlier form of Map 113, which was Map 104, and the demographer did not highlight at the 711 meeting that it was not contiguous because con non-contiguous maps were automatically disqualified from contention in this process. Second, I was not pleased that map 113 was labeled a racial gerrymander by National Demographics Corporation. As I stated at the 7-Eleven meeting in public comment, there are times that race and poverty equate. Socioeconomic factors were used to draw a map 113, and because people of color are disproportionately poor, these demographics are often nearly conterminous on maps. But map 113 was definitely not a racial gerrymander. There are persons of all races living below the poverty line within a few precincts 
of District 5, so poverty and lower income status is diverse within the city of Thousand Oaks. I, firmly, I firmly reject any assertion that it, was because, because, that it was a racial gerrymander because that is a direct, direct representation of my intent and of my character to imply that there was racist intent in drawing my map. To another point, areas of lower socioeconomic status often vote at much lower rates, so it makes sense to group them together so that their voting power is not diluted or divided. Disadvantaged communities must have a voice, and I will continue to advocate for that voice. So I, I will submit these items for the record to show, to demonstrate my um, point about it not being, about it being contiguous. Thank you. Next up, we have Patricia. Patricia, you've got three minutes. Go ahead and begin when you're ready. Yes, I'm Patricia. Everybody knows me mostly as Chase's mom. And I was very offended at the last council meeting for two reasons. The speakers, the whole council dismissed, were dismissive of the speakers. And to do teenagers like you did and their future voters, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And if any of you are still sitting there when they're in a voting age and they decide to win, run for office, I hope they take you to the cleaners. Second, 106B, it was legal. Yeah, it, it was legal, but it was shady too because it is designed to try to dilute community of colors and poor communities with their vote. And why a council member would want to be in District 5 where he did not want to sign an anti-hate resolution, I don't know why he would want to be in that district because I'm in that district and I'm going to make sure the right person gets on the city council next year. And I know you're not supposed to address council members, but I'm gonna address you, Al Adam. You sat there and you tried to demean my son in public, degrade his map, make fun of him, and you, you actually, you, you clowned yourself. And it was racist in intent. You took that good old boy mentality from the South and you brought it here to Thousand Oaks. And I did not appreciate it because Chase has always treated you with respect. And that's how I raised him. He was raised by me and his grandmother. He is not a statistic. He is intelligent. And he's been doing these maps for years just for fun in different states. So he did know what he was doing. And the mayor did not follow proper protocol when it comes to the council. When you were attacking my son's map, he should have stopped it and said, let Chase come up and defend his map. You even I tout Councilman Newman for being transparent on Facebook, uh, I mean on Twitter. He, he, he would have went with any map that was fair. You know, you have a real estate investor sitting here, and a real estate agent was the one that the map, 106B, is a real estate agent created. And so it's all about who's going to fund your pockets or, or do it. Uh, it, it who's going to fund your pockets? You go with the highest bidder, your puppets. But I really am ashamed of you, uh, Al Adam, because I've always defended you, you know, and I will never give anybody on here the benefit of the doubt again. And my son did email all of you about the mistake the demographer made, and they came after him too. The only one that responded, he, he, he's an all, he, I'm going to finish, he emailed the city manager, he emailed all of you. The only one that responded to his email was David Newman. So that goes to show you you're not representative of everybody. Council, uh, do you have any questions, anything you would like to uh, share? Now, could I have a motion for the uh, balance, removing Papa P out of the um, consent calendar? A motion. Mr. Newman, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Engler? Yes. Councilmember Newman? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Now let's come back to uh, you have to read the ordinance, is that correct? Oh, no, it's second reading. Second reading. It's, so let's uh, go back to item P as in Papa. Uh, Mr. Newman, you have the floor. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mayor. I, I have no statement to make at this time. Um, as you all know, I voted against this motion um, in our meeting last week. And for housekeeping purposes, for reasons of consistency and conscience, I, I wish to be consistent in my vote. And um, I'll move the motion and I will be, after checking with council, I will be voting against my own motion here. Thank you. Any um, other comments by council? Madam Clerk, call the roll. Councilmember Engler? Yes. Councilmember Newman? No. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes 4 1 with Councilmember Newman voting no. And I do have three ordinance titles to read. Ordinance amending Title I general provisions by adding Chapter 16 district based elections, 1000 Oaks Municipal Code, to establish district based electoral system, adopt a map describing boundaries of each district, and identify districts to hold district based election in 2024 and 2026 to implement district based elections. Elections Code Section 10010, Ordinance Number 1715 NS, Ordinance Adopting Specific Plan Number 24. 2150 West Hillcrest Drive and its associated zone change and authorizing land uses and development standards and set specific plan. Applicant Latigo Hillcrest LLC, ordinance number 1716-NS and ordinance approving, approving development agreement with Latigo Hillcrest LLS, or I'm sorry, LLC, relating to development of property located at 2150 West Hillcrest Drive, APN number 667-0-113-075, Thousand Oaks, California, development agreement 2022-70777, Dagger, ordinance number 1717-NS. Thank you. Well done, thank you very much. We'll go to item 12, department reports. With that, we have uh, our legislative affairs manager, Mina Leba, who will join us on Zoom. Mina is gonna talk about city of Thousand Oaks fiscal year 23-24 and 24-25 legislative platform. Mina, you have the floor. Good evening, council members. I'm going to be sharing a screen here. Tonight I have before you the legislative platform for your review and approval. After the adoption of the city's biennium budget, I bring forward the city's legislative platform for adoption and implementation over a two year period. The platform reflects the city council's goals, top priorities and current legislative trends. The basic framework for the legislative platform rests upon two principles, local control or what many cities refer to as home rule. This principle protects the city's ability to govern locally and independently without interference by other agencies such as the state. And number two, local budget, which is the protection of local resources and funds to assure that the city can conduct business and provide services to our community without impact to the city's general fund. In the platform, you see sections of specific policy areas that the city monitors and advocates for. They include telecommunications, infrastructure, transportation, mobility, housing, affordable housing, homelessness, or now what's being referred to as unsheltered, public safety, energy efficiency, environment and sustainability, open space, wildlife corridor, economic development, land use, business improvement district, tourism, and arts. As part of these policy areas, the city will advocate for time sensitive issues that, and then also those that have regional influence. An example of time sensitive issues is 
COVID-19. Two years ago, there were a flood of bills related to COVID-19, operations, meetings, and federal assistance. This year, our Metropolitan Planning Organization, Southern California Association of Governments, or SCAG, is involved in the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, or RENA, reform process with the state. Also, Cal Cities is working with member cities on developing equal taxation structure on fulfillment centers and will seek legislative amendments to implement. As for regional interests, SCAG, Cayegas Water District and other agencies in our region are often challenged by legislation that impacts their ability to provide services to the city. The city, if requested, will consider sending letters to support their issues. An example of participation is adding the city's logo and mayor's signature to coalition letters. We did this this year for Clean Power Alliance and California Stewardship Council. It is important to note that there are limits to local advocacy. The city will not take positions on areas where it does not have direct authority. Examples are individual rights, such as the Second Amendment and reproductive health. Federal issues, such as immigration, international issues, war and trade and also areas where there is a bona fide elected body that has the expertise and oversight over an issue, for example, the school board. To help with advocacy efforts, the city is an active member of the League of California Cities or Cal Cities and the National League of Cities, which serves as a voice in Sacramento or Washington DC on behalf of municipalities. They lobby on behalf of cities, identify key bills and funding opportunities, provide education and training. They coordinate annual meetings and conferences to bring cities together to cohesively discuss common issues and interests. The city is also represented by Joe A. Gonzalez and Son, state lobbyist, and Jim Crum, senior vice president for Van Skoik and Associates on Capitol Hill. To recap the city's legislative program, number one, advocacy under the auspices of the legislative platform for state and federal legislation. Two, the pursuit of both federal and state funding resources and programs. Number three, annual meetings with council members and state or federal representatives to discuss local interests and issues. Number four, participation in Cal Cities National League of Cities and regional organizations. And number five, the daily monitoring of current state and federal proposals, budgets and trends. To keep you informed on what's happening in Sacramento and Capitol Hill, legislative advocacy letters are shared with you via council mail. Newsletters, reports published by Cal Cities, National League of Cities, regional organizations, state federal lobbyists, state and congressional delegation are shared in council mail. Legislative updates are prepared and shared via email on breaking news, policy proposals by the White House or governor, budgets and trends, and a legislative dashboard is also prepared quarterly and shared via council mail that provide you a summary of bills and issues and their status as they move along the legislative process. Staff will also support council members participation in Cal Cities and National League of Cities for meetings, conferences, and policy committees. This concludes my presentation on the legislative platform. I am here to answer any of your questions Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mina. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? I'm showing zero, is that correct? Excellent. Council members, any uh, questions for uh, Mina? Mr. Newman. I, no questions, but I wanna compliment this report on two counts. Um, one, both this report and the regular legislative updates we received from Mina 
uh, Leba are, are somehow managed to be simultaneously comprehensive and succinct, um, which is a neat trick. And, and secondly, I, I encourage all residents, if you're interested about what is and isn't uh, the proper role of city government, um, there's a very good overview of that report. Um, so on both of those, uh, kudos for, for preparing this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, just Mr. a quick, um, quick uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Leba, um, in terms of uh, the legislative output this year, um, where are we standing um, as far as, I know there's quite a few bills that came out, and I'm just wondering where are we standing on some of the ones that we were com uh, concerned about? I think one of the top concerns the city has is always housing. And this year, the big trend in housing is adaptive reuse where you've heard the term not in my backyard. Now the new term is not in my professor's backyard or not in my congregation's backyard. Um, there is big movement to take away local land use from creating housing in these areas and streamlining that housing, taking away our local land use authority. Unfortunately, because of the way our state sees housing and the need for housing, many of these bills are moving forward, but we're still working with the League of California Cities to try to push them off. So where we are in the process is our legis state legislature is on vacation. They come back for the last six weeks of um, bill cycles and hearings, and then these bills will go to the governor. So we are still on the offensive. We're still looking to see where these bills go and uh, we will keep you posted on where they are. But that's um, one of the key issues that we're concerned about. Thank you, Ms. Laban. Thank you for your efforts on behalf of the city and the city council, keeping us informed and also doing your advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. I, I just want to compliment you again on what a wonderful job that you do keeping us organized, whether it be in Washington, D.C. or Sacramento that oftentimes the other cities who don't have your talent in their city look to us and say, what does Mina say? And it's a high, high compliment for, for you from other cities looking your way. I do have comments from people asking me as a now mayor, former council member, and soon to be council member, uh, is that what's your biggest challenge? And I can honestly say it's navigating the imposition of Sacramento has upon my city as well as the other cities in California, where they know best on how to run their, our, our cities here in California. They want us to solve their problems that they created. And it's difficult when you've got a city of 1,500 people and their solution is more suitable for one that has 8 million. So I, again, uh, applaud you for navigating and helping us get through the Sacramento maze. But it's one that, again, I wish Sacramento would take care of city issues and let the cities run the cities. With that, Mr. Adam, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, there was a section in the report that dealt with the California state budget of $310 billion, and it looks like the state has set aside $2.7 billion for, and what stuck out for me was the preservation of existing affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, that interests me because um, in my mind, it's a lot easier to keep people in affordable housing than to try to build affordable housing. Not that I'm against building affordable housing, it's absolutely necessary, but uh, you know, I, I read a report recently uh, on homelessness in the state of California, and it talked about the root cause was a lot of people were just priced out of their homes, simply priced out. Maybe their, their rent was 1500 it was raised to 1900 they couldn't meet they couldn't meet the gap the 400 dollars different they could couldn't raise it but I do understand that our county has um, funds that can help people meet that gap and keep them in that affordable housing and to me that's a lot cheaper and effective to keep somebody in affordable housing than to have them leave it and have to create it for them anyway. What I'm getting at is we talked about the mobile home parks last time and potential for ownership. I mean, that is true affordable housing here in the city of Thousand Oaks. I wonder if any of this 
$2.7 billion might be approached in the spirit of the preservation of existing affordable housing when it comes to some of our mobile home park residents owning the land underneath their unit, mm -hmm. which uh, would certainly establish them in a much more secure fashion than where they are now. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if these funds would qualify for that kind of thing. Comment? It well, I can speak to the effect, we, in relation to the mobile home park item, um, as council knows, we'll be back in the uh, first meeting in September, and we intend to at least have a bit of dialogue about that. Um, I do know, you know that that pot of money, um, there's a lot of different components to it. Um, um, Assistant City Manager Ingrid Hardy is working quite a bit with the Rapid Rehousing Program uh, through the Continuum of Care and Landlord Engagement Program, and a lot of those funds are directed through the Continuums of Care to those entities because you're correct, is that you know, catching people before they become homeless has been a, been a real focus and priority. I believe we actually are gonna have representatives from those different areas speak um, uh, under special presentations in the, in the fall to provide some additional um, information. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I'm currently working with the Continuum of Care to provide an update to the City Council on some of the other efforts related to homelessness. As Drew mentioned, keeping people in their homes is the least expensive route to go. Um, so they'll be prepared to provide the City Council with an update on some of the other programs. Good, good. I, I look forward to hearing that. You know, I hate to think that someone would lose their apartment literally over a couple hundred dollars and become homeless when somehow we could step in and make up that gap and keep them there. It, in the long run, it would save everybody a lot of time and a lot of money. Thanks, Ingrid. And the discussion by council. Could I have a motion for from council? So moved. Madam Clerk. Council Member Angler. Yes. Council Member Newman. Yes. Council Member Taylor. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam. Yes. And Mayor McNamee. Yes, and uh, Mr. Adam, that was that moving motion. item 12A, one and two with CEQA, correct? Excellent, thank you. And I'm, I'm well motion. trained by the city attorney. And that motion passes 5-0. I have to perfect my motions, don't I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll move on to item uh, 15, council issues recommendations. Mr. Giles, human resource director. Uh, we are going to um, see our city attorney and city manager leave the room. So we'll give them a few moments, then Mr. Giles, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, it is appropriate to take both item 15A and 15B together as they are related items. Uh, these items uh, address the compensation of the city manager and city attorney, and that's why they have stepped away from the dais. State law requires the council to take these items up as a discussion agenda item. The city manager and city attorney are, are employed pursuant to employment agreements with the city. These uh, employees report directly to the council and their agreements require the city council to review their performance annually. On July 11th, 2023, the city council met in closed session separately with the city manager and the city attorney to discuss their performance. The council rated the performance of both employees as outstanding, noting numerous accomplishments. The council provided the mayor and human resources director with authority to negotiate compensation adjustments. The resolutions before you contain amendments to the city manager and city attorney agreements. A non-substantive correction was made to the city attorney agreement amendment that was in your packet. Uh, the resolutions contain a 6% salary increase for fiscal year 23-24 and a 4% salary increase for fiscal year 24-25. This increase is consistent with compensation increases provided to employees across the organization and is within the authority provided by the City Council. The recommendation is to approve both the resolution in 15A and the resolution in 15B and find that the actions are not a project subject to CEQA. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you, sir. Council, any uh, questions of uh, staff? Thank you. Madam Clerk, I'm seeing there's no uh, public speakers, correct? Excellent. So we're gonna move on to um, any discussion. Madam Clerk, would you please, actually we need a motion from the floor. Who would like to do this? 
Well, um, I will just say that, uh, oh, I was going to start talking and then motioning. Should I talk and motion or motion and talk? You're, you're, go ahead, you have the mic. No, I, I was just going to say, <laughs> I, and Tim mentioned <clears throat> that uh, these um, increases that the city attorney and city manager received are right in line with all the rest of the people that work for the city of Thousand Oaks, and that we kind of decided this time around that maybe we would make this a two-year process in, instead of a one, as we do for everybody who works for the city, and I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, we'll still review their performance on an annual basis, of course, because they're the two of, you know, two of the top people of the city. Uh, but I, I like the way this came together. I think it makes a lot of sense, and um, I'll just say that I, I've seen a lot accomplished in this city over the last year or two. We've made some uh, some uh, things happen, just leaps and bounds, and I can congratulate Drew and Tracy and the staff for helping us make that happen. And, uh, and as far as the city attorney goes, I've never seen so many challenges that a city attorney faces these days. Uh, her plate is full uh, with all the things that are, that are happening. So I would move uh, Can we a, do this correctly? 15 A and B. Superbly done. And it's not a CEQA violation. Excellent. Did I get that right? Yes, you did, sir. Wonderful. Madam Clerk. Council Member Engler? Yes. Council Member Newman? Yes. Council Member Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes 5 0. And we can invite the city manager and city attorney to come on back because we're going to ask Mr. Powers for comment uh, this evening. So we'll give him a few moments to get settled in. Thank you, Mayor McNamee, and uh, uh, this is uh, the last meeting of the first uh, kind of term of the year, so we're uh, entering council recess. Um, did have to pick up an extra meeting here to accomplish some of the things that we had in front of us, but our next meeting will be Tuesday, the, the uh, 12th of September. Uh, the meeting is still taking shape uh, for that evening, but we know we will have a department report on senior mobile home parks uh, and uh, a public hearing on uh, CDBG for our CAPER. Um, we're also aiming for potentially an item related to navigation uh, to our navigation center. Um, just a, a word of uh, appreciation to both the um, uh, the organization as a whole and to the city council it remains a great privilege to serve the citizens of Thousand Oaks and I feel very honored to work with uh, the five of you. Thank you, sir. With that, I would like to uh, wish everyone a very safe and enjoyable summer break. Look forward to seeing you all back September 12th. Meeting adjourned.